Hello, everybody. Uh, we're starting now. Uh, welcome to our seventh webinar of uh, our open course for the Youth Lab IGS this year. Uh, today, we have two very special guests. We have Belen Jimenez from Paraguay, and we have Luis Rigel from Brazil. And they're going to be talking a little bit about uh, COVID-19 and uh, implications for privacy and security. Uh, so we're starting today with Belen. Uh, everybody, hello to Belen virtually. And then if you want to share your screen. Yeah. Uh, you well, hello everyone. Uh, good afternoon or yeah. In Spanish we say buenas noches. So I guess, uh, well, saying good night doesn't mean the same thing, but <laughs> uh, no matter where in the world are you, uh, you are now, um, yeah, I just wanted to say hello. Um, I'm here in Paraguay. Um, before sharing my screen, I wanted to uh, tell you a little bit about myself as well. I uh, work at TEDIC, which is an NGO that works towards the defense of human rights on the internet. And uh, I've also been part of, of this program since 2018. Um, I got the fellowship to go to the LAC IGF in Buenos Aires two years ago, and then I went to the global IGF in Paris uh, in 2018 as well, and I went to the one in uh, Berlin last year. So it's an honor for me to be here sharing this space with you guys, um, also being on the other side of things, I would say, as a as a guest in this uh, very special places. And, and yeah, so... I'm gonna share my screen now. Okay, there we go, I found it. So can you see it now? Yeah, yeah now I do. <laughs> Perfect. So, um, first of all, um, I'm gonna say that I'm just gonna talk a little bit about uh, some um, issues or things that, that need to be considered when it comes to developing or implementing technology in times of uh, COVID-19 as a way of like thinking of them as like a technological solution basically and why uh, there are many things that we need to just basically analyze before doing that. And um, we know that we are now facing very particular times, very like ex extreme uh, times and we're under very peculiar situations that have been, never been experienced by our generation. And considering that um, in an era of, informa of information technologies, what measures are being taken in, in the region? And right now, in, in times of emergency, people have been mobilizing, using the best of, of their abilities to respond and to propose solutions. And these responses increasingly have to do with uh, digital technologies. And within this framework of actions, there is an increasing number of agents uh, from civil society and also from technical community and the private sector uh, that along with uh, the public sector as well, in many instances, um, build or launch, um, sorry, build or launch uh, self-monitoring and notification um, applications or platforms uh, for the uh, society, for, for community, uh, for active citizen participation as well. And many of these uh, technological solutions uh, ignore privacy and personal data protection standards. And when these considerations should be actually the, the basis of any development or implementation of technology, since um, this, this proposed solutions basically uh, carry out health data treatments or like many other kinds of sensitive information. So um, some examples are um, based on or focus on bi biomedical or social control uh, platforms. And these solutions basically uh, are, work, uh, are working based on collecting an important amount of sensitive information for example, health diagnosis, geolocation, uh, even used for commercial purposes sometimes. And um, therefore, it is very, very important to like basically thinking about how to evaluate uh, these, um, this technological solution, let's say, and how these impact democracy in the context of emergencies. 
such as the ones we are like such as the ones we are experiencing or going through and also one thing that i wanted to say that sometimes these initiatives are done truly with the best intentions from many different sectors however um, they do not have enough preparation or they do not take into consideration certain uh, personal data or privacy standards uh, when when it comes to implementing the synergies and there are also many other things to be considered uh, when it comes to these so uh, also i wanted to uh, to give some examples um, in the region for example in argentina uh, the covid19 ministerio de salud app ha has been developed uh, in order to to do a self-evaluation based on the symptoms that you may have and this this app um, is actually uh, the one from the government, but also alongside there, there have been other apps and platforms uh, that in order to do like an analysis that are not official. So um, these are basically pretending to predict the behavior of the pandemic through the use of our artificial, our artificial intelligence, for example. In Bolivia, the education ministry presented the Corona, Coronavirus Bolivia, uh, an app that uh, gives information about uh, prevention and how to take care of, of the symptoms as well, um, frequently asked questions and even numbers of emergency. And they also publish data and official uh, periodical newsletters uh, that are often updated. And they also have uh, like a site in which uh, they can they can basically verify fake news or public uh, discourse in order to fight against uh, disinformation. And in Brazil, there has been the coronavirus S S U S coronavirus SUS app uh, that also, besides uh, allowing for self evaluation, it also, according to what it has been. Uh, in, in media while I was doing my research. It also provides with information about prevention, uh, available uh, health units, and also like it alerts uh, about many like updates when it comes uh, from the Ministry, Ministry of Health. And also they have been collaborating with uh, Albert, As uh, Albert Einstein uh, Israeli Hospital in order to uh, publish a site for self-evaluation as well online, which is autoavalia autoavaluacion coronavirus uh, dot Einstein dot Brazil. Sorry about my my intent of like Portuguese mixed with English there. Um, also in Colombia, they have a corona corona current app uh, proposed by the Ministry of Health and the Institute. Uh, the National Institute for Health, in order to do a monitoring of the health states of, of people in Colombia, uh, either if you're a national or an international person who is just uh, who, is, who is there. Um, it also provides information about governmental measures and so on. And um, it also has a website that allows for people to access um, the, the the peaks and the, the progress of of the pandemic. I wouldn't like to say progress, but like the growth of the number of cases and so on of the pandemic in the country, and also the number of people recovered. Uh, and in Ecuador, they have an app called Salud Salud Ec, which is a telemedicine channel that it's also complementing the strategies from the from the governmental side in there. And also has like self evaluation and sin like to prevent symptoms. But this is not. Um, this is also accompanied by another site that uh, reports news like their fake news when it comes to the pandemic as well. Guatemala has developed Alerta Guate, and in collaboration with Israel and Google, that I found kind of interesting. Um, and this app is based on the platform of emergency mobile communication and. According to to what I've heard and also to what I've seen, the, I've seen this from um, the colleagues from Derechos Digitales, which they they did a great job compiling all this information as well. Is that it offers specific alerts according to people's uh, geolocation um, that are also reproduced in an audible form. Uh, they also provide instructions and general information and and even communication with like 
up with a human being, <laughs> a personal assistance through an SOS button, according to what it says. And then Honduras launched something similar as well. However, this is independent from the government. And uh, that's something to notice as well. And then in Mexico, they've launched uh, an app called COVID-19MX uh, the start of April, basically, and it's offering direct access to attention uh, channels, self-diagnosis, more information about close uh, health clinics and centers, um, and many other kinds of information, along with a website that they have, and even a chat box, a chatbot for self-diagnosis and the monitoring of the, the tracking monitoring of the ones who reside in the city of Mexico, which is also something to notice, because then we're going to talk about uh, what can come afterwards. And then in Uruguay, lastly, um, they they had an app. Um, called Coronavirus UI, a focus on allowing for the self-diagnosed and to offer solutions for the ones who, who have the virus. And this has also been um, done in alliance with the government as well as part of the national plan for against coronavirus as well. They also have a chatbot and other alternative communication channels, for example. So these are all for me, an example of uh, the coming back of uh, techno solutionism because there are many many things to consider for example when these solutions basically or the things that are thought as solutions even if they are derived from civic technology and even if they say that they will provide with open data like or you know be like all the information will provide will be provided in open data format even when when those things are um are the base of this um still without having a comprehensive look and without proper maintenance we can expect very unfortunate unfortunate results especially when um we do not take our particular regional context into account for example there are many countries that have been using uh, similar technologies, but they are more developed than our countries. Uh, so for example, uh, you have countries such as Hong Kong and South Korea, uh, that they they do have like public health systems that are robust, public policies um, and of universal health coverage. And um, they have been, they, they had experiences of using technological applications that have been positive in, to some extent, uh, but then our situation is quite different. So I think that we, we also have um, a lack of many things, for example, lack of rigorous uh, text, tests of context and development of proper knowledge when it comes to also analyzing our, our local situation, the myriad of groups that are uh, being impacted by this. And also we have weak and precari precarious institutions that are basically trying to say that with an app, everything is going to be solved and in reality it's not going to be like that and there's also a lack of a comprehensive approach to uh, technology technological solutions when it comes to uh, having a human rights approach in here so as a result we have these apps these very low quality apps and platforms that do not even have uh, guarantees uh, when it comes to the protection of fundamental human rights for us such as our right to privacy for example so the, this is something that we need to take in, into account. For example, some cases of uh, proposal, proposals or ideas demonstrate the belief that with a doctor of any specialty uh, and a group of computer scientists, you can help improve the health system. But in reality, it's much more uh, systemic than that. Um, also, it would be ideal for other types of knowledge and profiles to be included for these types of proposals and ideas when it comes to uh, thinking of the developing, developing and implementing uh, different types of solutions. Uh, for example, uh, public health doctors with an emphasis on epidemiology would be one step. People who are specialized in the field of economy, uh, people who are specialists in information catalog cataloging, lawyers who are specialized in human rights, designers in U.S. based on the protection of personal data, cybersecurity engineers, and so on. On the other hand, 
um, enterprises who or companies that are basically developing or implementing these technologies should be articulated with public health policies and they should incorporate an institutional and financing perspective as well in order to see how these can be sustainable because in the long run if there is a lack of political interest once the, like the times of the pandemic pass by these are eventually abandoned or even worse they are used but the the emphasis not being put on the on the efforts for the security and privacy of these platforms. And that's also one thing as well, which is the second point that I have there in that slide, is the speed to which these technologies are being uh, developed and, and implemented. Because these, these sometimes are often launched without even determining whether they solve or not the problem. So in here, we're just having this lack of a critical look, of a critical um, lens in which we we need to ask ourselves, what's the real problem we, behind all of the situation? Is it, is it our health system or is it that we truly need an app or a platform to solve it? And what are we solving with, with this? On one hand, I think that many of us often, as a uh, in an intuitive way, think that adding technology to all of this is great. But in the end, there are many things that we need to to consider, right? So that on one hand, and uh, we need to analyze also in each one of our countries uh, the lack of public policies that sustain these technolo technological solutions over time. So, because these right now, when emergency situations like these appear, are sort of like improvised solutions that come continue to operate with very, very high social and economic costs. So we also need to analyze how is that having an impact in our country, how much money is being put into this one app or one platform that in the end will not account with like enough or substantial uh, standards of like privacy and personal data protection. So that's on one hand. And so as one of the of key considerations that I, I wanted to share with you guys is basically that the lack of good practices in the, in the treatment of sensitive data is very evident in our context or in, our, in the local proposals or ideas for technological solutions. If you guys come to think about what has happened in your countries, and that's something that I want to hear also by the end of, of, of my talk is basically saying that there, there's, there's a, like, how do you say, uh, I want to say, historial, like a history of, of lack of proper safeguarding standards. And they re definitely represent a door to amplify instances of surveillance uh, especially when we come from uh, from many backgrounds of dictatorships and uh, um, countries that are just very authoritarian. So just analyzing that it's like many of these technologies may be continue to be used uh, without our consent for for other purposes. And some of them even have the most basic lack of, of security <laughs> infrastructure standards, like a lack of uh, HTTPS, which then you you have to enter this is a very insecure platform that does not have like a secure connection and these are the ones that store sensitive personal data um that, so that's just one of the examples um in, here in paraguay we we've had two cases of uh, coronavirus uh health platforms for resources in which people had to uh, put their personal data in order to get access to that and the two of them have been hacked uh, very easily. So that's that's one example based also on the lack of connection of, of HTTPS uh, protocol, basically. And many of them, at least um, in Paraguay, they are just like, they have been developed so fast as a, like a very improvised solution that they have, they are not being published in open data format. When you want, when you want data, it's like very, messy or, or very inaccessible or very outdated um no they do not often have like proper protocols for anonymity so if you download a sheet it might be like scanned and it might be with everyone's names and ids so that's something that for me it's kind of severe <laughs> When it comes to protecting the the privacy and personal data information of the users, especially the people who who are in need and they are the ones who try to enter to these platforms the most, 
So there's also a lack of transparency in, in, in sharing how the processing of, of these uh, data will be and the storing of, of this data as well, which is something that I found as something very concerning. Another thing is that this fantasy of like using geolocation platforms and apps in order to solve or combat COVID-19, which in reality for me means that is a, a breach of privacy. And it doesn't really work because the only thing that is actually locating or tracking is our phones, not the, the virus, right? So uh, it, this is important to distinguish as well. And, and not many people really think of that in, at the first time, but that's what these apps are actually doing. And it's not something new either, right? But um, it's just sometimes that instinctively, we, don't, we do not re really realize of that and what we're giving um, as a result. And, and, and I just, uh, according to the, the, the second point that I add in there, um, so for example, there's a, there was a publication on mass surveillance in China that they had a mobile application called Alipay, derived from Alibaba, which was able to classify people into three categories, red, yellow, and green, indicating what they must do with each code. And basically, these, um, the, the type of software they, they used was unknown, uh, was an algorithm basically that was, used to, that was being used to classify people. Uh, but however, they had this lack of transparency in the way they, they stored the data and everything. And some software auditing that, was, that has been done to that show that um, the application was allowing the authorities to access the phones of the users of the application by a backdoor, basically. So just as an example to think how these uh, technologies can be also used for that, um, that's something very concerning as well. And um, for example, South Korea had a case of tracking people through their geographical position using uh, mobile phones and cameras, uh, recordings, and also credit card uh, purchase histories. And that's something that I found very problematic as well. And along with that, you have examples uh, proposed by Facebook, for example, the, the project of maps of disease prevention that ba was based on mobility uh, trends, um, also contact tracing, and uh, which is very similar to a project announced by Google, uh, which um, aims to record geolocation data from phones in order to compile statistics on the mobility of people in the countries or regions in order to evaluate the effects and degree of, of compliance with uh, quarantine, uh, uh, social distancing, and confinement. So that's something very problematic. And there's this uh, international organization uh, called Access Now that basically um, said something about this because it was very concerning as well. Because the, uh, what they say was that the location data is very revealing. And uh, by simply following a person's movements based on location data from a smartphone, uh, one can deduce the address of their home and of their workplace. They can map their interaction with others. They can identify other visits, um, where if it's to a doctor or whatever, they can infer on their socioeconomic status and many other things. All of this without proper security measures. Um, and because of the, because of the lack of this uh, tracking and and geolocation tools can definitely enable uh, surveillance that is ubiquitous, that is just basically in many different places. So that, that's on, on, on one hand. The other thing that I wanted to talk about was uh, the issue of transparency when it comes to dealing with sensitive health information and uh, also the, the, the social problem that is generating, generated through that, uh, through the lack of responsibility when it comes to dealing uh, appropriately with the information of the ones who have who have the disease, for example, in Paraguay, there there has been uh, some cases of social discrimination and stigmatization uh, that included even death threats. In here, we call it uh, escrache to the public chasing or persecution, even in social media. So also in digital spaces, uh, instances of digital violence then. And also um, as a result, the, the way we look at this uh, pandemic is being distortion and basically filled with hate and prejudice. And that leads to a popular approval of the implementation 
adaptation and develop, development of these apps and platforms because we also give uh, we give trust to this so we think okay because of these things that are happening because the people are being irresponsible and are getting sick yeah let's implement technology for surveillance and let's control so we will make sure to know who or who are the ones who got the disease and who are the ones who were irresponsible and we do not then measure objectively as well the way in which the implementation of these tools uh, also affect our individual and collective rights. And another thing uh, when it comes to social control is uh, the risk that uh, most of our countries in this region have a high degree of corruption and authoritarianism. And imagine having these tools at just our, at their disposition and there are many questions that are raised in this situation. How are these technologies uh, deployed or how will they be uh, deployed? Are they going to truly stop being used once this, this pandemic time, I, I wouldn't say stop, but like at least gets a little bit better if once we consider ourselves out of this particular time, are they going to be stopped like when it comes to their use? And do they truly comply with scientific protocols and for testing and development? Most of them we know that they do not comply because they've been developed and implemented so fast as an improvisation, as a, like an improvised manner of like providing a solution that they, they do not truly comply with many things. And they do not even comply with quality mechanisms uh, for their use. And do they possess a contextual applicability focused on human rights? Most of them, I don't think so. And also, there another very important thing to ask ourselves is what is the line between the the things that are being used to control and to, and do some surveillance of the disease, and what's the what the what's really the line between that and the population surveillance? I think that right now um, those lines are sort of blurred. And that's something that we need to, to really consider as well, because that's something uh, problematic. And um, just in order to conclude, we need to think, uh, like, I'm not really saying that we should avoid the use of technologies in these times. What I want to emphasize on is that we do need to build on what we already know and to think for solutions for our current and local context based on our situation as a country, as a region. So this is related to demanding systemic solutions that maybe have absolutely nothing to do with the implementation of technology. Uh, so we need to think more critically about implementing technology and not to fall into the techno-optimism or the techno-solutionism. Which in, reality is, which in reality is not going to solve uh, the pandemic. So we need to think about things such as better health care, a better health care system, especially in the public se uh, sector. And also we need to have a better grasp and understanding of our social, economic, uh, political and technological infrastructure and the capacity that we have. Because even considering the the level of unequal access and connectivity in our countries, how are we going to pretend that proposing platforms uh, or applications is going to really work if uh, the most vulnerable populations do not have uh, a good level of connectivity or access to the internet? So some uh, technological principles and considerations that I wanted to talk about, like if people decide to go on with the development and implementation of technology in order to ensure the privacy and to comply with a certain important standard is basically to develop technology that basically has a policy of privacy and personal data that is accessible to the users that includes things such as informed consent, uh, the purpose of the platform, why is it gathering uh, certain data, uh, the quality of the data that they are ga gathering, the confidentiality as well, things related to security, who, who truly gets access to that, how are they taking care of the data, for how long are they going to retain it, and also to identify the ones responsible for the treatment of that personal data if anything happens. Also, um, another consideration to implement is to allow the users 
to basically choose and control the privacy settings to give agency to the users basically and that also including privacy by design in order to prevent certain security breaches and not to think about how to mitigate or how to solve them once they happen and also develop technology that only stores data that is necessary for the app to work, not unnecessary data. And also the data that is disassociated or anonymized, like that is not easily related to our identities. And also, which is related to the, uh, the reports, once it um, gives reports to its citizens to make sure that these are also anonymous and in a proper format. Another thing uh, which is related is that they should be published in open form data format in order for it to be more accessible and also if they need to deliver sensitive information to other sectors they can only do so in order by getting a court order done by the penal system now without any not just without having any other legal documents and uh to also notify the user in the event uh, that states, state institutions request their information for one reason or the other, uh, as well with the in, uh, transfer of data as well. And also it is very important to develop testing instruments. So what is, for example, what does it mean to be aware of a suspected case uh, what does it mean when the platform is talking about a confirmed case? What's the met methodology behind uh, these definitions as well? So in order to conclude, I, um, yeah, I know it's a lot to digest just what I said, but basically uh, my point is uh, hopefully not to fall on the techno-optimism or techno-solutionism. And if we do need to think of the development and development and implementation of uh, certain technologies for COVID-19 here in our region, we need to start uh, thinking about uh, tools that will comply with uh, privacy and data protection standards from the very beginning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Len, for this great presentation and the great insights that you brought into this topic. Um, if anybody has a question, I'm going to now one question now, and the rest of you that have questions for the Len, uh, you can ask them in the end. So if anyone has a question now, I'm going to allow one. So if you do, raise your hand. If not, we can pass it to Louise and then we can answer the questions in the end. So if you do have a question now, raise your hand. If not, we pass it on to Louise. All right. Since we are a little tight on the schedule, I'm just going to uh, give the floor to Louise. And then if anybody has a question in the end, uh, we're going to have some uh, Q&A sessions for both of you. So uh, thank you very much, Helen, again. And Louise, you have. Thank you, Juliana. Juliana, would you like me to do the same as Belen did and just uh, share my screen or? It's uh, totally up to you. Uh, I made you co-host of the session. so Okay, you perfect. Okay, no, no, that's fine. I'll, I'll go ahead and, and share. Okay, can you all see perfectly the, the PowerPoint presentation? Yeah? Okay, I'm just going to take it that as a yes. And let me turn on my camera because that's also nice, right? So, hello, <laughs> hi everyone. Um, so it's it's literally uh, past midnight, so it's like twenty to one a.m. Uh, so I'm really going on coffee for this. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. Um, so please let me know if I'm speaking too fast um, or, or if you have any questions at the end, I'm most happy to respond to them. So I'm Louise Marie Urell. I am a, a researcher and project coordinator at the Cybersecurity and Digital Liberties area over Igarapi Institute. I don't know how many of you know about it, but it's a security focused think tank. And so it deals with like security as a cross cutting uh, agenda um, issue. Um, but I am coordinating projects on the cybersecurity and digital liberties area. And I'm also doing my PhD uh, at the Department of Media and Communications uh, over at the London School of Economics. So I'm based in the UK which explains why it's late right now. Um, but yeah, but today I'm speaking on my personal capacity. So I'm speaking uh, with my LSE hat uh, to put it 
uh, like that, uh, but definitely drawing on some of the things that um, we've been working on at Igarape when it comes to surveillance technologies and monitoring technologies. Okay, so just wanted to make that clear from the start. Um, and so it's, it's a real pleasure to be here today and to be able to talk to you um, about this. And I'd really like to, um, uh, to follow up on what Belen just said. So she really talked about, you know, the technological enthusiasm and the technological solutionism that they do not translate into efficiency when it comes to looking at the local and kind of regional context of our region. And definitely it presents us with very worrying and perhaps paradoxical challenges when it comes to security, when it comes to incorporating these uh, solutions that are built in specific contexts that are translated into different realities such as those of the different cities and I really think that when we're talking about technology it's not even about you know the country but it's really about the city uh, that we're looking at because uh, as we've seen it's not it's also not just about you know the level of connectivity across the region which is still very much below 100 percent um, but definitely it's also about the social and economic inequalities and about how people think about their access to these services how much they legitimize that as a solution and how much that legitimation actually uh, endorses, as Belen said, you know, particular forms of government um, and a more centralized, more authoritarian government is definitely a trend that we're seeing across our region. So it's very worrying to not think critically about uh, these kinds of things. So I really want to, um, to, to so following up on, on the presentation, I really want to talk about more of the structural questions regarding the inequalities underpinning the context of COVID-19 and the normalization of the use of technology in this same context. So I'm really going towards a very deep structural, even conceptual um, discussion right now. And I really want to take us there because I really think that when it comes to, to questions such as the implementation of technology, when it comes to the very practical aspects of the decisions that are being made in terms of making security uh, features available for the user to determine what is the level of security that they want, I think it took, it, it's, it's you know a series of things that are built on kind of like even like socially acceptable understandings of the place of technology in, in Latin America and the place of COVID-19 as a risk and as a political agenda as well uh, in our countries. Um, so yeah, so I really want to touch upon that. Um, so bear with me uh, because I'm going to bring more examples towards the end. Um, and, and at the beginning, I really want to do set the scene. Uh, so the first part, I really want to lay the grounds for thinking about risk about uh, and technologies more generally. Why is it so important for us to talk about risk? Well, risk is really the key word for a moment that we're living now. Uh, the, there's a clear health risk and there are several tech solutions that seek to deal with that risk. But are they really tra like tackling the risks um, at what cost? At what cost in terms of our rights? Our rights in terms of um, freedom of assembly, in terms of freedom of speech, in terms of uh, right to privacy? Um, and who benefits from this risk, right? Um, and are these risks evenly distributed throughout the population or are they very unequally uh, distributed, um, especially when we think in the context of the big tech companies and the gig economy? In the second part, I really want to talk about two dynamics that are operating paradoxically together in this context, at sometimes legitimizing the indiscriminate use of tech um, and surveillance measures as a solution to COVID-19, and at other times delegitimizing it and pushing back on the same use. So think about, you know, uh, facial recognition and banning facial recognition in the context of COVID. So it's it's kind of like these do this double movement, which I want to touch upon. And finally, I really want to draw on two examples, just bring two examples from Latin America, one from Colombia 
and one from Brazil, uh, which is where I'm originally from, um, about how these surveillance technologies have been implemented and the problems that come with that. But if there's two things that I really want to, you know, the key takeaways of today, I really want you to think critically about the moment we're living in, think about the discourses about risk uh, that are echoed at, in your respective countries. And I really want to hear about that and how you think about this reality in your country. And second, to understand technology contextually and think the ways of resisting to these solutions where massive data collection remains kind of the spinning wheel uh, to, to, to efficiency, to how we think about efficiency. So these are the three kind of parts. Um, and in the first part, so why is it important, you know, for us to talk about risk, you know, I've just taken that for granted. Uh, but it is exactly because risk is not just about, you know, the disease and the pandemic. It is really because risk is socially constructed. And therefore, we need to understand how COVID beyond the health crisis has become part of political, social, and economic crisis all around the world. And most importantly, it has become a risk with powerful implications to our ways of living. The risk has determined that we are gonna stay at home. The risk and the policies that have been implemented have, have decided that you know, we should perhaps, as suggested by some governments, take that precaution or this precaution, or that maybe we should open you know, the economy now or open the economy later. So determining a risk has political implications and is a political element in itself. Um, so when we're determining a risk is really determining a problem and it is creating a dominating logic of risk that requires action. Uh, so COVID-19 implies in the mobilization of different logics of risk concerned with health, sustainability, and most importantly, technology and technological solutions. And so I really wanted to bring the, this tweet from Antonio Guterres because I really think it's a great tweet in terms of, of thinking about that. Uh, when he actually goes to Twitter with his influence and his position and says that we're facing now a new enemy and that this enemy is an infodemic, he's clearly kind of creating and mobilizing a powerful vocabulary over there for determining the risk associated with COVID. So COVID, as I said, is not just about the health, health issue, but it's definitely about creating this plethora or at least an identifying this plethora of other gravitational, you know, gravitating risks around it, um, which are political agendas if you look at it that way. Uh, so, so really kind of uh, in this case, um, a, the risk associated with COVID is a risk of spread of false information and disinformation. But uh, as you can see in the tweet, it's quite interesting that he follows with the normative side of it, of, of like the, the policy implications of that. As I said, you know, the risk doesn't come alone. It comes with a proposition. And the proposition over there is really clear that we need to urgently promote facts and science, hope, solidarity over despair and division. So that is kind of like the solution to the identified risk. Uh, so it's really interesting to see how that plays out in really shaping the way we see the pandemic. And obviously it leads us even to the question of like the role and the place of social media in shaping our understanding. Once we, we go through the pandemic, you know, who will tell the history of the pandemic? Who will be able to kind of voice what were the major risks and, and who was actually being affected by it? And we definitely know that these narratives, they just create greater kind of cleavages um, when we look at the, you know, at the past, uh, at the past. And in this case is not different, you know, are we going to remember the people that are delivering our stuff at home? Or are we going to remember, you know, the politicians that, that, that were uh, claiming that they knew what were the best solutions, you know, for us to take, I don't know, hydroxychloroquine uh, in the case of Brazil as a precautious measure. Um, so yeah, so th this, is, this is kind of like the structural elements that I was talking about. I really think that we need to think about these things. And in other contexts, we have seen that the COVID has again, a, again, legitimized the role of scientific evidence and scientists 
in a world where we have seen the rise of anti-vaxxers and terraplanistas. Um, and on the other hand, many countries such as the UK, let's say, has said that the strategy for combat in COVID was completely led by scientific evidence, when in fact it was much more part of the discourse of legitimizing the strategy rather than actually using scientific evidence to do that. Um, so Ulrich Beck is a very great renowned scholar. He's a sociologist and I really don't want to keep talking about theory over here, but he says something really interesting for us to think about risk. Um, uh, he argues that our society has become increasingly preoccupied with the future, so with controlling risks. Uh, so this has led us to the de development of systemic ways of dealing with insecurities, technology being one of them, risk is the driving force of social change. It operates with power because those that have influence can provide new mandates for risk. Uh, so when figures such as Trump uh, delegitimize risk by saying that bleach could be considered treatment for COVID, he's certainly using, uh, though not necessarily purposefully, his influence to delegitimize the challenge of COVID. Um, and when, for example, Bolsonaro, uh, says that COVID is only a flu, he is certainly and purposefully renegotiating the understanding of risk and with that, the priorities at the national level. But one of the things that I really want to kind of talk about is that another scholar, uh, Ursula Jasper, she talks about, you know, in this risk politics of risk and, and creation of these logics of risk, um, that there is what she calls in, in, the, health, uh, in the health sector, the anticipative medicalization of life, be it the creation of an increasingly dense and important network of big data-driven diagnostic and surveillance tech technologies that allows fewer and fewer potential risks to our well-being. So think about, you know, like the use of technology for risk mitigation and well-being and health is not something new. Uh, this, the COVID is just yet another expression with greater legitimacy because of the exceptionality of the context. But think about, you know, Fitbit and uh, tracking apps, the health tracking apps, um, and even more intrusive ones, such as the ones that track your period and, and things like that. Um, so, or even at the individual level, think about, you know, think about these things. Uh, this is a, yet another expression of things that we have been legitimizing. Um, so, so the legitimization of the current uses of technology, they are not, it, they do not operate in the vacuum. So there's this history of kind of like what we thought that was acceptable and what we might think might be more acceptable right now since we're facing, you know, this extreme scenario. Um, so just so we continue with our discussion, and I'm really taking a little bit more time in the beginning, but it will be a little bit um, uh, more, you know, fast paced to the end. Um, the second part is really kind of, um, um, sorry, is really thinking about, you know, I mentioned that risk is socially constructed and it sets a political and technological agenda. However, data really kind of supports this dynamic of risk and informs what kinds of responses and actions are required. So with the advent of datification of our lives with technologies that range from smartphones to sensors to those that are you know, part of the city or not, um, surveillance technologies, platforms, uh, it has become more validated that technologies are inherently beneficial uh, to our individual economic and social life. So take, for example, terms such as the fourth industrial revolution or AI for good or tech for good or any other movement like that, it kind of like brings the optimistic side of it, with, which Belen already talked about, you know, this technological optimism that inherent, it, it is inherently good to use these technologies. I'm not saying that there's not benefits to it, but it's much more blurrier than, than the discourse says it. Um, and just if you're interested, datification is really kind of like the quantification of our everyday life. And it's a term that was, you know, set forth mostly by uh, Mayor Schoenberger and Kukier. So if you're really interested in kind of reading more about it, please uh, drop me a line. Happy to send you um, more references. Uh, but the thing is that when we bundle these kind of accepted standards of, you know, data, data collection, it really becomes statistic models. And these statistic models determine 
the truth about uh, what are the risks and how urgent they are and what kinds of responses and models are needed. Um, and in Brazil, for example, one interesting case was that a couple of weeks ago, President Bolsonaro decided to stop sharing updated data about COVID-19 with the purpose of having greater control over the narrative uh, of constructing a positive narrative uh, about COVID uh, instead of actually portraying the cases and how catastrophic this, the, the whole situation was. Of course, this backlash, but it shows how uh, the individual and the aggregated data are the raw material uh, for building this politics of risk. It reclaims the virus for itself and it follows, depending on the case, you know, a political agenda as, as, as the, what I mentioned. Um, so, so really now that comes the interesting bit, which is um, uh, when we think about, you know, what Ulrich said um, that, you know, the risk society, um, the risk society is driven by the logic of a dispersed risk distribution. Um, this other uh, scholar, which I really recommend you read, uh, he's Dean Curran, and he suggests that this logic of risk is really about increasing inequalities uh, and that people people are not exposed to risks in the same way. Uh, so even though we're all facing the pandemic, you know, more people are more at the front line of facing these risks. So think about Uber drivers, uh, Deliveroo, Amazon workers, and all of the workers of the gig economy that are on the front lines while others are doing home office, you know. So these are kind of the unequal distributions of what risk looks like in practice. Um, and solutions with te technological solutions they normally don't account for that. When you think about COVID contact tracing apps, I mean, are they actually considering the nuances of, you know, the demands that the economy requires in order to operate, especially these people that are working with like very low wages and they're having to expose themselves. And, you know, they're, they're really kind of facing the risk of getting coronavirus. So are these technological tools and developments really translating the reality of our, our, our everyday life? Uh, so risk in this case provides new horizons for the perpetration of inequalities. And, and Shoshana Zuboff is also one of the great scholars. She talks about surveillance capitalism and how it further places this risk dynamic in what she calls, you know, a global system of behavior commodification. And also another, um, you know, and, and we, and another kind of element to that is that, um, we, for example, give Facebook our data for free and they transform it into money into a market of trends, which is redirected to us um, and uh, with no democratic oversight. Um, and I think this is something that we've talked about a lot, but like when we look to kind of the legacy that these kinds of trends provide us in the context that we're living in now, it becomes even more worrying. Um, and, and finally, another concept that we would like to bring here just to kind of think critically about the moment we're living in and about the inequalities that it brings to our region is really the concept of um, data colonialism. So, um, so this, what, what uh, Nick Coldry and Ulysses Ali Mejias actually argue is that, you know, the datafication or the quantification of our everyday life is not evenly distributed. And for example, less facial records, uh, you know, of, of people with different gender or different race or different et ethnicities uh, create meaningful biases in technologies and efficiency be becomes selective in this way. Uh, so, so this data hungry kind of economy, uh, which, you know, provides us with solutions for our pandemic, it's actually, you know, something that has a very selective kind of efficiency and that actually perpetrates what they call, you know, a new form of colonialism uh, where, where we're subjects to these kinds of, uh, of power dynamics in terms of data extraction. Uh, and, we, and they actually say that we need to resist to that. We need to have decolonial ways of resisting to that. So bringing the discussion to our own realities and thinking critically about, you know, what are these solutions actually bringing to us and what are they not? Are we importing uh, these solutions or are we actually creating and adapting them? Um, so these are kind of like the decolonial ways of, that we can engage uh, with, with the context of the pandemic. I'm mindful of the time, uh, but I'm really 
you're gonna go a little bit faster. Um, so this just to say, you know, that risk is not distributed. It provides horizons for the perpetration of inequalities. And we can see that through how surveillance and data colonialism takes place during COVID. Um, so how can we talk about this in practice? Um, I think there are at least, you know, two movements that are happening right now and two um, that, that are operating within this logic of risk that I, I was talking about. And that inform, you know, the current surveillance tech during COVID. And one is the trend of exception, exceptionality, you know, the dimension of exceptionality. So starting with, you know, South Korea using contact tracing apps and saying that it was very effective. This is a graph of uh, a chart of a graph of the of the case of South Korea and just like how they flattened the curve and how they managed, you know, to control the, the spread of the virus. This is not applicable to all the countries. And as Belen already mentioned, you know, and uh, I'm, I'm going to mention afterwards, it's really not the case of Latin America. It's literally not the case of most democratic countries. You know, here in the UK, for example, it relies on your willingness to actually download the app. And if you're in a country in Latin America that has, you know, a little bit more of a, a, a muscle uh, or authoritarian trend, you might be subject to kind of this being imposed. And what is the legacy, like the data legacy that this will bring? You know, uh, as Belen mentioned, you know, like how, what are, what are the consequences for data retention? Um, so, but the consequences could be irreversible and, um, and we've seen that it is not necessarily about telling the story of flattening the curve, but it is about asking what are the right, um, what are, uh, what are the rights that are at stake? Uh, when the solution becomes legitimized in democratic countries? Um, is it about privacy? Uh, is it about freedom of speech? If we're talking about content moderation in, in some cases. Uh, and the same goes for facial recognition and border control, uh, which are other experiences in this process. Um, so the main practices of you know, this exceptional moment are about tracking uh, effectively uh, social distancing measures. It's about gathering information to determine the data of infected people. It's really about monitoring specific areas in specific cities across the region. And it's really about kind of almost a platformization of responses to risks through these apps. If you, if you take them really as one of the core examples of, of kind of the, the, the ideas that have been circulating as a potential kind of easy response to that. And obviously, on the other side, what we see is paradoxically, while we have the exceptionalism, we do have the accountability and responsibility, which is a very weird thing to think about. Because um, uh, on, on the other hand, you know, you see uh, with the BLM, uh, Black Lives Matter movement, you see, you know, big tech companies coming to the fore and saying, well, we're just going to ban facial recognition. And we do think that that is not good for this context. Um, and but at the same time, you know, they are, you know, other companies such as Apple and Google are still providing technologies for contact tracing. Um, so so it's kind of like ambiguous when you look at, you know, the accountability and responsibility, especially when it comes from these companies providing technologies. And when it comes to facial recognition, you know, it's just the big tech. What about the techs that are, you know, especially like neck? which is one of the main uh, companies providing facial recognition technologies in Brazil and in other countries in Latin America, they haven't said anything. And they are the main ones providing these things. Uh, so there's a whole market over there that becomes silent. And sometimes we're distracted with some wins uh, and we, st we should definitely strive for bigger wins. Um, and, and now, um, kind of going to the question of like, how can we situate these dynamics within the region? How can we look at the realities? And I think one of the things of like a failed, uh, failed kind of example is, um, is in the case of Colombia's contact tracing app, uh, which basically they tried to pass to establish a contact tracing app. Their, the implementation really failed. They had to remove the contact tracing feature from the app uh, because after experience glitches that they had and in in its place South American country it has thought to adopt you know as a solution to the glitch to really adopt Apple's and Google's contact tracing technology 
to substitute their own technology and um, because it perceives it as more reliable than its own. Um, and, and Apple and Google has said that, okay, let's, let's do this. Uh, so, so this makes me question a lot, you know, like content tracing as a risk solution, uh, is, is it a solution for all? It, is it something, you know, like this magic word or, or something that we should be heavily focusing on? I really don't think that the answers um, to the coronavirus uh, are necessarily technological. Uh, the solutions for coronavirus, they are about, you know, investing in healthcare. And I think that's something that we've, we've, we've been struggling a lot because I think sometimes we, as I said, buy in many countries in the region by uh, this narrative that, you know, we need to adopt these technologies because they're going to make it more efficient to track. But if we don't have data sets on the people, if we don't have health data that is structured and secure, if we don't have protocols uh, for data exchange between, you know, the healthcare sector and the different, sec in the different you know, public private healthcare systems, how are we going to do that? Um, and are we going to start, you know, using very intrusive measures because we cannot have, you know, stricter data sets to do that in the data minimized way. Um, so, so there are kind of like very basic level of data management and, and securing data and privacy of that data that is really not considered. If you look, you know, uh, I can say more specifically from the context of Brazil, but Brazil hasn't, you know, implemented its own um, data protection law. So how are we even going to start the conversation? I mean, so, so these are the things that kind of build up. Um, so I really don't think that contact tracing is a solution for all. And just to close, because I know I'm really, um, really going over time, um, is, is to talk a little bit about, you know, like Brazil and what we have been doing also bringing some data from um, the research at Europe. Uh, so really Brazil for the past years has really enhanced its system of surveillance through different, you know, big events uh, from, you know, the pandemic, the Pan American Games in 2012 until, you know, the World Cup and uh, the Olympics. So that was a moment where you had like a boost of, of investments in technology. But really, you know, right now what we have been seeing is really the controlling of the lockdown through GPS data. So not only, you know, trying like different cities across Brazil, trying to partner with organizations in order to have more precise geolocational data and even you know in Rio for example they use cell phone signals uh, from communities or favelas to track social isolation and determine the degree of effectiveness of the measures so I mean these and this is something interesting from the inequality side these communities these favelas they are not even present in Google Maps many of them and you're using this level of intrusiveness, you know, to, to actually kind of datafy them. Um, so it's, it's really kind of like very paradoxical. When it serves, they are seen and they're mapped through these kind of data techniques. Um, and and why is it, how is it serving, you know? Um, obviously, I'm not fully critical about, you know, using data and using technology technology to assist in the COVID response, but definitely these are kind of like the deeper considerations that we have to think about. Who's this uh, technology benefiting and what kinds of inequalities is it, it's, uh, is it, you know, creating? And obviously there's, you know, a late, we shouldn't see this technology as something that just appeared. So there's a whole layering of technologies uh, that come. So in the case of facial recognition uh, in Brazil, we mapped you know, different cases reported throughout the, the, the whole of the country. Uh, we identified 48 cases and four different um, types of implementation trends. But what, we, what is really interesting is that, you know, these technologies, they rely on CCTVs, which rely on, you know, operational systems, which rely, you know, on having, you know, a structured kind of uh, computer uh, set of computers and, uh, and different centers. So these things come together to kind of provide the efficiency that we think is needed. Uh, and when it comes, you know, to using facial recognition in different cities indiscriminately, you know, what we've seen is that the, the expected result is high, but the effective, the kind of like the real result is very, very under the 
what's expected. Um, so, you know, like techno solutionism, think again. Um, and obviously in this context, it, it couldn't go unnoticed that when we're talking about risk and legitimizing risks and actions, when we, when we legitimize, you know, risks such as, you know, fake news and hate speech, uh, especially uh, in the context that we're living now, we're definitely talking about very intrusive measures uh, that can come from trying to deal with that exceptional risk. And one of the things is the current uh, uh, bill on fake news. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm not gonna go deep into that because uh, as I said, we're short out of time. Um, we're short in time. But just to close, um, let me put this already. Um, risk, as I said, you know, is socially constructed and sets political and technological agendas. Data supports the dynamics and risks um, of risk and informs what kinds of responses and actions are valid and risk is not evenly distributed. So in Latin America, it leads to the acceptance of models of surveillance that are specific uh, to other contexts uh, sometimes. And, and again, you know, the two takeaways from today is really um, to think critically about the moment we're living in to think about the discourses that are being echoed and the discourses about risk uh, in your respective countries and that we shouldn't take technology and the notions of what's acceptable, take, it, we should not take them for granted really. Um, and second that, you know, we need to understand technology contextually and think about new ways of resisting uh, to these solutions uh, where data is, you know, the spinning wheel. Uh, to this greater narrative of efficiency. So yeah, thank you very much and uh, happy to discuss in the questions and hear your experiences as well. Thank you so much, Louise. Uh, those were great insights on the topic. Thank you very much for sharing them with us. Uh, as we are a little bit tight on the schedule. Uh, if you have any questions, please either raise your hands or type them uh, in the chat. Uh, we can allow for a few questions, but we don't have a lot of time. If uh, I also have a question, so if nobody has a question for now, I'm going to ask a question for both of you. Uh, I wanted to know, uh, given the great um, insights that you gave us about uh, what are the prospective uh, actions that people could take in order to, uh, to change the situation that we're currently living in, considering our surveillance and also the security weaknesses that we face with uh, the applications that we use. Uh, what would you say is the role of civil society on that? Uh, not only, I mean, regular internet users, but I'm saying like civil society organizations, think tanks, and uh, people that work directly with policy. What would you say uh, should be the main concern of those actors when it comes to to facing the current uh, um, surveillance and cybersecurity weaknesses in the COVID-19 uh, scenario. Uh, the question is for both of you, so whoever wants to start, or if just one of you wants to answer, that's fine as well. Well, uh, coming from civil society, I would say that uh, the first thing that comes into my mind is also the the inequality in in the way in which this is going to have an impact on the on different social groups right who are the ones who are going to be the most vulnerable again and how the the cycle of violence is going to be perpetuated by the use of these technologies and um, that's on one hand on the other hand it's just to tackle this notion that in relation to what I said and also to what Luis was mentioning of like normalizing the implementation of technology in order to solve things and uh, without really analyzing the, the, the structural problems that are not related with technology at all and how to firstly analyze that and to be aware of that and to question that before even considering uh, developing or implementing uh, an app or a platform. Great, thank you so much, Belen, for your answer. Uh, Luis, do you want to? Yeah, 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 yeah. So really, really quick. Um, I think I have two points. The first is really about um, 
I think there's a role uh, civil society and academia or think tanks as well have a really important role to play in gathering evidence. I know it's not easy and it's becoming even more uh, challenging, especially in the context of technologies to, you know, gather reliable data. Uh, but I do think that we do have a very central role to play in gathering evidence on implementation uh, through, you know, our transparency, access to um, access to information laws or similar channels or really interviewing people, mobilizing our networks, you know, and working with organizations. Uh, so thinking about implementation and also contributing with uh, benchmarks and policy proposals, uh, I think that's a really powerful way of mobilizing. And also, I mean, the second one is something that we already do a lot, but I think we can be better at that, which is, you know, coming together and questioning these narratives coming together and i mean this this questioning it goes for civil society and academia as well you know our our own assumptions about technology and and how we create you know stronger claims uh, in advocating in a moment where it seems that we're less and less heard um so yeah thank you so much yeah i completely agree with both of you i think uh we spend maybe too much time like relying on on governments in order to to get actions done and, and i think it's time for us to realize that that's not going to be that's not going to be useful anymore like we're not in a democratic scenario uh, at least not in brazil anymore for it's been a while uh so i think uh your answers were really spot on i see we have another question from benjamin uh benjamin do you want uh to type them or to speak you have the floor also a question from eduarda uh let's let uh benjamin go first yeah i've unmuted you so you have the floor thank you thank you very much thank you very much for your presentation very interesting uh, i think the technological principles and implementation and implementation consideration that you mentioned are very important uh, considering the privacy and security that must be taken of the data. Uh, well, I think that in these times of quarantine, uh, we must take into account that increase of internet connection and use of application uh, has increased the violation of personal data. So my question is more about uh, protecting no technological users. Uh, many internet users tend to act with greater vulnerability or ne ne negligence uh, with respect to their personal data, even sensitive uh, ones, because of the desesperations to obtain uh, supposed immediate uh, benefits from application of se or services, and especially because of the fear of, of coronavirus. Uh, what do you think would be the best tool to materialize, materialize protection measures of uh, for users? Do you, you do you think that uh, public policies uh, implement by the government? Could be the answer, or how can we protect more users to understand the importance and risk to which they are exposed with the improper treatment of their data? Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Benjamin, for your question. Uh, whoever wants to answer that first, or if just one of you wants, go ahead. Yeah, I would uh, briefly like to answer that. Uh, one thing that comes into my mind is uh, um, the the need to to think of holistic digital literacy programs that also take into account uh, the needs of, of especially the, the, the most vulnerable groups that probably do not have uh, uh, unequal access of connectivity. And that's around the 55% of the continent, I would say, like, um, is, in, is in that group. So it's, it's, uh, it's a big percentage. Um, and how to i think that that has to have you know like efforts not only from civil society and the academic sector but also it has to be um has to have the participation of, of different sectors as well like a multi-stakeholder approach uh in in there as well there has to be an effort in order to um in spanish we say bajar a tierra to like um simplify many concepts ideas and things we're talking about here uh, in order to make it more friendly and approachable to, to the majority and to make them understand that there are there is there is an importance be, behind 
knowing the, the risks and how to empower yourself by acquiring certain practices uh, when it comes to innovating or using um, digital tools and, and platforms. So digital literacy is one thing that comes into my mind as a summary. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much, Belen. Uh, Louise? Yeah, I mean, uh, definitely education and digital literacy is the kind of cornerstone to all of that. I definitely agree with that. I would only add, you know, that first, I, I personally do not necessarily agree that either, you know, the individual should have all the responsibility for knowing how to deal with this technology. But on the other hand, you know, I do think that the, the individual should be knowledgeable and understand the risk risks, even though most of the times we don't know such of the risk because the, the way innovation operates is that we don't know the risk, but it's out there. Uh, so we only know the risks after that. Uh, so we have to kind of work with mitigation strategies. So that is why security becomes such, you know, a pessimistic place because you just, you just have to work with the uncertainty. But what I actually mean with that is that um, I do think it's also part of, you know, bringing greater responsibility to the developers of these technologies from the engineers and data scientists to you know the the companies that are especially startups that are developing and testing these technologies so i do think that in order to ensure um that that we can actually have you know uh you know a, a good safeguarded uh you know and that the, the, the educational measures are actually effective we do need the other side, which is the developing side of the technology. So there's no way we can have a baseline level of education and understanding of the population if we don't have a conversation with the private sector. Um, so yeah. Yeah, absolutely agree with that. <laughs> uh, we also have a question from Eduarda. So if, um, I'm gonna unmute you for a second. Yeah, you have the floor. Hi everyone, thank you girls for the presentation, it was very informative uh, and I have two questions. The first one is, has the technology concretely contributed to fighting the coronavirus? Do you know some research or a paper, I don't know. And how can we question the treatment of data collected to combat the, the virus but are being used for other uh, purpose? Thank you. Great, thank you very much for your question. Uh, whoever wants to go first, you have the floor. I, I can go, just give me one second so I can structure my thoughts. <laughs> because Belen is always going first, so it's not fair. <laughs> yeah, she has more time to, to kind of like go through her thoughts as well. Um, mm -hmm. So one thing is uh, how tech has actually contributed to uh, combating COVID. And the other one is how data is, uh, can you repeat the second part again? Oh, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. I think someone muted you. I am muted Eduardo, right now. So if you want to repeat the question. Are you hearing me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the second one is about how can we question the treatment of data collected uh, to combat the virus, but are using uh, for another purpose? Okay, um, so the second one, I would definitely say that um, first we need more transparency about how the data is being used, uh, because I think right now we really don't have much insights as to how, where the data is coming from, uh, especially for these apps, uh, for example. Uh, so we do need to first have some transparency over what kinds of data are being assembled, even if they're coming from different, you know, departments, different ministries, different agencies, and even different companies, uh, in order for us to understand, you know, even the risks and also, you know, how they can be potentially being used for other purposes that are not the ones accorded at the beginning. And I mean, that goes circles back to the question, you know, like, do we have, you know, proper data protection legislations in the countries that can actually enforce, you know, uh, especially when it comes to context exceptional such as that. I know that the Brazilian law, for example, does not cover when it comes to uh, public security or, you know, national security issues. If the COVID comes within, you know, the, this exceptional scenario, we, we, we have to kind of push uh, that the, the, the principles of exceptionality, you know, that the principles of necessity, proportionality, that they are observed in these contexts. Uh, so, so I really cannot respond to the, you know, the other uses 
because I really think it's really hard to, for us to know now. Uh, maybe after COVID come, uh, comes through, maybe that pool of data that is collected through that assemblies of data will be used for another purpose. So we have to be careful of maybe reading the TORs that are being set by these uh, tracking apps or any other kind of solution that we're uh, using or service from the government, even if it's informational. If it's collecting data, it should have a specified reason for doing so and the, you know, the limits of how that data is gonna be collected. Um, and how tech has actually contributed uh, I think tech has actually contributed immensely to the context of COVID. I think there is a lot, you know, of, of thinking about how I know that some cases in Brazil, like with specific communities, um, the, the local government was actually reaching out to influencers from a particular community in social media to actually, you know, broadcast really good, reliable information on COVID. So I think these solidarity networks that are forming in this context are, are really kind of a very nice gain. I think solidarity is something that we need and hope. And, uh, and I do think that social media, in spite of the whole craziness, has been used in coordination with local governments in a very interesting way. I can say that uh, from the Brazilian context, at least in some cases. Right. Uh, thank you very much, Luis. Uh, Belen? Yeah, uh, I think, Police basically did an excellent job responding to that. I would just shortly add to uh, the necessity of um, uh, regarding to what she said, right? To uh, having um, uh, when it comes to transparency, like a, a policy on uh, the treatment of personal data and, and privacy, basic something that is clear, that is simple to understand, that is accessible in different formats. And um, when it comes to that basically uh, asking the, the right questions such as okay for for how long is this data going to be like gathered or how for how long is it going to is it going to stay or uh, what are they going to do afterwards uh, are they going to get rid of it and like, who gets access to this data you know those are the crucial questions that we need to to ask um, and we need to make sure that it, it, they are pretty clear in those terms of like use and, and services that's on one hand. On the other hand, I, I when, when, when it comes to their question, I definitely agree that there are um, many benefits of uh, technology in, the, in these times when it comes to joining efforts in order to provide and current and proper information to, to people. So we are basically following uh, the, the, the whole process, not only in our countries, but also in the worldwide level, right? Um, there's, I agree also with the point that there's also uncertainty and, and when it comes to seeing what will happen afterwards with these platforms for, for, that are like the corona apps, let's say. Um, but uh, I think that we need to look at also at the countries that are a little bit more developed and they have some history of use uh, of when it comes to these instances because many of them are like at, at least a step further than us for example let's look at what's going on in china or in korea right now and see if they have some some examples in which we can be we, we can use as a base in order to to have the same examination in our countries in the in the near future right great thank you so much but then uh pedro what's your question sure you can do that uh uh, let me just unmute you. Uh, go ahead. Um, hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so, hi. Thank you all for your presentations. They were very um, enlightening. Um, Louise, in, in the slide of your presentation, you mentioned how big techs are stepping up to fight COVID-19. And one of the ways they're doing so is regarding content moderation, and authentication. Um, I was listening to, listening to a podcast um, from the New York Times the other day, and they were interviewing the chief executive from YouTube. And apparently the current pandemic is the first time when they actually put a official sign directing to official information about COVID-19. I saw this, the, the same thing happening in other platforms like Spotify and Instagram. And um, my question is, do you have any views if there will be a legacy of holding social media platforms 
responsible for content moderation after the pandemic because uh, apparently there's um, a new maybe rise in the horizon regarding content moderation. And I'd like to know about that. And Belen, Belen if you have any um, specific views on from a um, civil society point of view, I'd like to hear them too. Oh, and um, no, that's it, <laughs> sorry. Thanks, Pedro. Uh, whoever wants to go first, you have to join. <laughs> Yeah, I can go first. Um, thanks so much, Pedro, and, and all of you for the questions. They're really, really amazing. Um, um, so yeah, so regarding, you know, whether, you know, companies will actually, will there be a legacy, uh, whether they will, you know, continue to uh, be more proactive in doing content moderation, I do think yes, yes. Um, so if before they were kind of like in the gray zone, uh, when it came to um, to elections, which was the moment where they were more pressured to do content moderation and take down particular accounts. Now with the pandemic and with the risk of like the real life threatening risk of, you know, misinformation uh, becoming, you know, a, a real thing and uh, actually affecting people's lives and jeopardizing their lives, which is the narrative of the risk that I was talking about. Um, I do think that right now they're really going to step up their game and they're going to continue to do so. And since, you know, Facebook actually did that, it's like the big one signaling to the others or the subsidiaries uh, that, you know, this is the trend. Obviously, you know, they have the, the money and the power to do that. Um, and, and obviously, you know, they will have to step up their game in terms of corporate social responsibility in order to, to, to you know, continue to be uh, somewhat, um, let's say, uh, not necessarily compliant, but, you know, trying to keep their good image uh, with, with, you know, the different societies across the world, but definitely it will become more challenging uh, once, you know, we have things like they taking down content on Twitter from Trump and Bolsonaro. Uh, that is a huge step to take. Um, and I do agree that, you know, in terms of communicating uh, world threats, uh, they did that and localized when, when there was, you know, a uh, natural disaster, they actually posted specific warnings. That was a way of doing that. And now they did full scale, which I really think it's really good because they're using the platform for something other than, you know, targeted advertising or, or collecting, collecting massive uh, uh, amounts of data. Uh, so definitely I do see that the trend will continue. Uh, and I don't think it will pay off not to do that in the next couple of years because then you know governments are just not going to endorse any any kind of social media platforms that try to operate in a non kind of response they they set the baseline basically um and others will have to follow somehow great thank you so much louise i uh, also agree with louise and one thing that i would add from a civil society standpoint is that um basically the one well it also involves the the government as well because uh as i understand there are also countries who, that are working towards uh, a law in order to regulate uh this information big news and uh they i think it has to have some coherence because then that could take that there's probably the, the that could open the door to to proposing things that again promote censorship or for example there's this uh, law proposal that has been worked on i think i believe it is in in <clears throat> in, in brazil if i'm if i'm not mistaken that is kind of confusing still the, like it's uh the law project known as uh, yeah fake news the fake news law and uh there are so many things that are being worked on because there's a concern that that might lead to censorship and also uh probably tracing how many times a message has been sent and by whom like the data of the users are, that's what's being proposed as i understand it's gonna be like um retain how do you say almacena for some reason i cannot think in english right now uh but you know those things are concerning so it's also like it has it requires a multi-stakeholder effort to analyze as well and to work in sync in order to make sure everything works and hopefully leads to a better scenario when it comes to this. Great. Uh, I definitely agree with that as well. Uh, 
Uh, well, I think we are running out of time at this point. Uh, if anybody else has a question, this is the moment for you to uh, type that on the chat. Otherwise, um, we're going to be wrapping up in the next few seconds. Uh, well, I don't see any questions in the chat, so I'd like to first thank so much to participants here. I know Louise is probably very late in London at this point, so thank you very much for staying up and share a little bit of your knowledge with us and uh, Lynn for the great insights and also for the civil society perspectives that you shared with us. And also I like participants uh, for spending some hours of your Saturday night with us today. And uh, well, we're going to have uh, another webinar next week about youth engagement and you're all invited to that as well. Uh, but otherwise, thank you so much. Buddy, nice uh, rest of the weekend, and you guys have uh, the email contacts for both of the participants. So if you have any questions, feel free to to reach them uh, through other media. And bye bye. Have a nice evening. Or I don't even know, Louise, what time it is in London. <laughs> it's late. two. It's like it's almost two a.m. <laughs> yeah. You know, caffeine is going out. So, <laughs> so yeah, it's the perfect time. <laughs> Great night of food for you. Okay, thank you. It was great. Thank you so much. Yeah, bye bye. Great. Thank you.